Good morning, beautiful physics kids. Uh, Mr. Johansson here. Today, we're going to be going over work and power. What is work? Well, work is the ability to do something, right? We're working on something. So look at this kilogram mass. If I'm just holding this, uh, I need to apply a force on it. How much force do I need to apply? Well, you have the mass of one kilogram in a different gravity field. Wouldn't I need to apply different forces? Yes, I would. So the acceleration due to gravity is going to be deeply important here. On Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. So the force I need to apply is its mass times the gravity field I'm under, 9.8 meters per second squared. So force, mass times acceleration. Newton's second law, mass times acceleration. So we have F equals MA. That's a kilogram meter per second squared. And on Earth, how much? 9.8 newtons of force. This equals 1 newton. So we could use this to figure out how much force. Again, 1 kilogram times whatever acceleration I'm under, 9.8 meters per second. So I need to apply 9.8 newtons just to hold this up. Well, what if I want to do something with this? If I apply that 9.8 newtons of force and I push this upward 1 meter, does that change this? Does that change the condition this is in? Take a look at this, all right? If I have this on the table and I have it sitting right here, okay, if I let it go, nothing happens. It's in this position and yet it doesn't have any energy associated with it, so it doesn't do anything. But if I lift it up even a little bit and drop it, whoa, look at that. Now, why did it do something entirely different. It reached that table, and yet now it had energy associated with it. Why? Because I had put energy into it, lifting it up, letting it go, that energy comes back out. When I do work on something, very often, energy can be stored in it. Now, not always, but the energy will dissipate in one way or another. So, we want to be thoughtful about this. <coughs> the formula for work equals the force of which we spoke multiplied by the distance I pushed the object through. So force times distance. What are the units of that? Well, we have newtons per meter. And a newton per meter is equal to a brand new unit called a joule, named after James Joule, a famous physicist. It's just abbreviated J, but it's called a joule. So a newton meter, new unit called a joule, and it's a measure of work. So in order to do work on something, I must move it. Uh, if I have my classroom desk, or how about this wall here, and I could push on this wall, I could break a sweat, I could grunt all I want, but I'm not going to move that wall. How much work did I do? Well, if I multiply any number, how hard I pushed it with any force, and I'm multiplying it by zero distance, I did no work on it. So to do work, you must apply a force and move something through a distance. So that's the idea of work, force times a distance. Um, how about an example problem just with uh, work? Um, a 300 newton force moves a box 20 meters. What work was done? Okay, straightforward problem. Okay, we have a force moving a box through a distance. Because the box moved, you know that work was done. So, Gibbons the force equals 300 newtons. The distance equals 20 meters. And we want to know what work was done. Work equals force times distance. And the S and S then, we don't have to do anything else with that formula. But please remember, if we do have to manipulate that formula, if I have to solve this formula for distance or something, all that manipulation, all of it, has to be right under the formula. We never, this is really important, we never just take that formula, toss it over here, and substitute in, and then solve 
for the unknown. The unknown gets solved algebraically right here. Okay? So we rewrite it. We also always rewrite it. Force times distance equals 300 newtons times 20 meters. Okay, before we go anywhere, do the units work out? Well, we end up with newton meters, so it's joules. That, that, yeah, that's pretty easy. Uh, and what's 300 times 20? We have 6,000 joules worth of work. That's how much work was done on this, 6,000 joules worth of work. Now, if I'm just pushing something sideways, is that work recoverable? In other words, can I get that work back? If I lift this straight up in the air, well, now it's up in the air. If it should fall, I could hook up some elaborate system of pulleys and things, and I could actually power something from it. I could make other things happen. In other words, that work is recoverable. We're going to talk potential energy. I have increased the object's potential energy. But if I have just pushed a box across a floor, how much is that recoverable? Well, none. None. I can't get any, any energy back there. So the question is then, where is that energy? What happened? Hmm. Imagine being dragged across the floor, 20 meters. That's 60 feet. Imagine being dragged on a carpet. Well, whatever part of you is being dragged, you'll notice gets really hot because of the friction with the carpet. Now, you can't do anything with that heat. That would be called low-grade heat. Low-grade heat is, we would consider, pretty useless heat just because there's nothing we can get from that. We can't get it to perform any functions in this world. So low-grade heat is pretty useless. But it comes out all over the place. Anytime you move anything, it ends up as being low-grade heat. Okay, pretty cool. What's high-grade heat then? High-grade heat is how I got to school today. Inside the engine of my car, the piston's working. Well, there's a huge heat differential, a huge heat differential between the inside of those pistons and the outside world. And the heat moving from there to the outside world, we couple all sorts of things in the way, and that's how I get my car to move. So that would be high-grade heat. You could use high-grade heat to power the world. Low-grade heat, all it does is turn into infrared radiation, and it sends its heat off to space. Very interesting thing. You have the Earth sitting in space, it gets X amount of sunlight falling upon it. That's energy. How much energy does the Earth then radiate to space? Over time, it will exactly equal X amount of energy. So the energy in is the energy out. Well, Wait a second, I'm using some of that energy. Yeah, all I do is I get in the way of that energy stream, use some of it to do whatever I'm doing, but it all ends up. Every bit of it turns into low-grade heat, and it gets radiated to space. But wait, what if I turn into fossil? What if I'm buried in a way that my body becomes oil or some petrochemical like that, and I'm underground? Well, eventually I'll seep out, or the oil would seep out, and degrade, Bacteria would eat it, turn into low-grade thermal emissions, sent to space. X, the amount of energy coming into Earth, equals the amount of energy eventually emitted by Earth. Generally, that's about the same all the time. But we could store some energy for a little while, but X equals X. So this is the idea of um, work. New unit called the Joule. Uh, I want to take a look, though, at... What's the base unit of a joule? So let's take a moment and look at the base unit of a joule. Okay, so uh, force equals mass times acceleration. That's a kilogram meter per second squared. And if work equals force times distance, well, this is then a kilogram meter per second squared multiplied by a meter. So we end up with a kilogram meter squared per second squared. That equals a joule. So those are the base units of work. Um, well, on to, uh, on to a cool problem about work, shall we? Let's try this.
So I have a 100 kilogram box on a wedge. We're going back to our wedge problem. And I'm moving that up the wedge 20 meters up this wedge. Now it's going to end up lifting it 8 meters off the ground, this 100 um, kilogram box. And I'm saying I need 500 newtons of force to do that. Okay, so the first question here is, how much work was done? Well, which of these numbers do we use? Well, which way was the box moving? Up the wedge. Good. How much effort did that take? 500 newtons. Does the mass of the box really matter? What if it was a one kilogram box, but there's so much friction here, maybe they have Velcro on both sides, that you need to apply this huge force. Okay, it's the force that matters when you're doing the work. It's not the mass of the box in this case that's gonna matter. You see the force, you see the distance that force was through, so that's really straightforward. So in this case, how much work was done? If I do, how about right in here? Givens, uh, the force equals 500 newtons, the distance equals 20 meters. We seek to understand how much work was done. The formula, work equals force times distance. Then if I S and S it, work equals force times distance. Work equals 500 newtons times 20 meters equals 10,000 joules. So I did 10,000 joules worth of work on it. Okay, the next question would be, how much work was done against gravity? Hmm, was well, against gravity, gravity goes straight up and down. If you look over there, I lifted a 100 kilogram object eight meters into the air. And when we talk about work against gravity, it doesn't matter how I got it there. How high did I lift it? How much does it weigh? Okay, so it's mass, we need to convert to a weight. How do we do that? Well, if you remember F equals MA, the force I need to apply to that mass equals the mass times the acceleration due to gravity. F equals MA derives to an equation W, weight equals mass times little g, gravity, because we're here on Earth, 9.8 meters per second squared. Therefore, I take this 100 kilogram box. First of all, I realize that box actually has a weight of 980 newtons. It's a 980 newton box and I have lifted it eight meters into the air. So how do we do that? 980 newtons times eight meters equals, I did 7,840 joules worth of work on it. Now the Gibbons formula S and S work out the same. Um, I did 7,840 joules worth of work on it. Question is though, look at that number. That's how much work I did against gravity. Look at this number. That's how much work I actually did. Where's the missing work? What happened to it? I pushed it up here. It was a frictional surface. So some of that work was used to overcome friction. How much was used to overcome friction? Well, subtract them, right? Just subtract the two. So it looks to be, what's that? 2,160, I believe, 2,160 joules of work overcame friction. And where is that? Ladies and gentlemen, that is right here. It's also on the bottom of the crate. Low-grade thermal emission. That's what it turns into, low-grade thermal emission. So this is the basic idea of work, okay? It takes energy to do work. What about power? What about power? Imagine you and I run up, you and I go up the stairs. I walk at a leisurely pace. You, and let's pretend for argument's sake that we're the same mass, 
You run up the stairs twice as fast as I do. At the top of the stairs, you breathe in harder, you may be even a little sweaty, whatever. Who did the most work? What's well, formula? Force times distance. If we both have exactly the same mass, don't we need to apply the same force to go up the stairs? We do. And if we both went up the same distance against gravity, didn't we both do exactly the same amount of work, no matter how fast you did it compared to me? We did. So it feels like something's missing there, because you're all hot and sweaty, and I'm just doo -doo 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 popping up those steps, and something is missing there. Power. So while we did the same amount of work, if you did it in half the amount of time, you used more power. So what's the formula for power? Well, let's check it out. Power equals work over time. This is how we figure that out. That's how you see that you used more power than I did, right? So if I did the same amount of work, but it took me much longer, let's say uh, it took us 10,000 joules of energy. We did 10,000 joules of work going up some flight of steps. Okay, you did it in 10 seconds. How much power did you use? Well, a joule per second. A joule per second, that's what we want. Um, and what would a joule per second be? What's the unit for joule per second? Watts, the unit for joule per second. That's a physics joke. I, I hope you get it. Watt, this is a watt. A joule per second equals a watt. Sort of like light bulbs and all sorts of electrical devices are measured in. This is a watt. This is how much power. Power is how much work is being done per second. So pretty cool to understand it that way. So this would be 1,000 watts. <clears throat> so you were doing a thousand, or, or what, I, I guess uh, this was me going up. So if you did this and you did 10,000 joules worth of work in five seconds, ooh, that was twice as fast. You did the same work in half the time. Look at what that comes out to. That's going to be 2,000 watts. So you did the same work, but you used much more power doing it, which means you were able to do it much, much faster. So this is the idea of power. You just take the work, you divide it by the time, and that will give you a full range of ability to figure out what the power of something is. Um, now, if you look, a lot of things a lot of things have power associations with them. This happens to be a 100 watt wah, light bulb. We don't use these lights anymore. As a matter of fact, you can't really buy them anymore. I have to look in the supply closet to get an old one. A 100 watt light bulb. This gets really, really hot. It's putting out a huge amount of energy every single second. Now we would prefer to use something like an LED bulb. Why? It gives the same amount of light for a fraction of the power. A couple watts will give the same amount of light. What will we miss? Well, there has to be something missing. If you ever turn on this kind of bulb and then touch it, you'll find it's really hot very, very quickly. Just within a few, within a minute, it'll burn your fingers badly. An LED bulb? Nah, it doesn't produce nearly as much heat to make the light. So it's far more energy efficient. So this is the idea on power. Power is how much work you do over time. And very straightforward, except what are the base units of power? We wouldn't want to miss the base units. You can tell these base units are getting a little bit more complex. So we really want to pay attention to that. All right, so if power equals work, over time, and work equals force times distance. That means we have force times distance over time. Let's look what the base units. 
So force is Newton. So we have a Newton meter per second, but that's not base units. So break the Newton into the base units. That's a kilogram meter per second squared. Now, if I multiply that times a meter, okay, that meter squared, right? That's a joule. But if I divide this by second, now right here, a lot of people go, ah, I'm not so sure how those units work. Go to the basics. Go to the absolute basics. You know the second is really second over one. Right? Everything is. If you have any number, it's really represented as that number, but over one. All right? If I want to get rid of something in the denominator without any cutesy math rules, how would I get rid of it in the denominator? Well, if I multiply this by its reciprocal, won't they cancel out? Yes, they will. Why? Because when you multiply apply them together, you end up with seconds divided by seconds. That equals one. So the whole thing disappears. But the only way I could do something like that down here is if I do the same thing, multiply by one over seconds up here, and I think now you can see what's going to happen. That's going to be a kilogram meter squared per second cubed. And that, that is a what? Yeah, sorry. It's a what? There you go. So that's how we do work and power. That's how we think about work and power. Um, we next are going to be talking about potential and kinetic energies. And that's kind of important to understand how these things work. Pay special attention to the kinetic energy formula. It really impacts your driving. It's an important understanding. It may save your life. So I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.